All right, is this recording? Wait, what, what's going on here? Okay, it is recording. Okay, hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this whole episode of the That Chapter Podcast, you're joining just Mike. Mike alone for this episode. And no, today, take- folks, no, no, Mike is alone for this episode. I'm going to keep talking to you. Today, uh, what I'm going to tell you about is we. Uh, I'm getting into this week. Uh, are you just going to keep laughing into the microphone, Keith? Well, let's leave, fully. Okay, bye. <sighs> You should do the thing where you you step, but steps get quieter. He's opening the door. Click. And he's gone. All right. Thank for that one. All right, folks. Uh, He's gone. I'm in the room. Now we can can tell you the real story about Keith. He (laughs) smells. Oh, shit. Okay. He's still here. All right. Well, you heard him. Unfortunately, Uh, Keith is joining me Mm -hmm. back for another episode of the That Chapter podcast. Say hello, Keith. Hey, Hello back. Uh, my back. nose is all black. Yes, it is it good is to be black. back. You know what? It's even yeah. Thanks for noticing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's giving you a bit of a like a sultry tone to your mm, voice. It does. Yes, I sound very sensual. All right, Keith, how are you? Are good. you ready and able for another episode of that chapter podcast? Can you handle it? Is the question I have for you today. And I'm fucking stoked. You're stoked, dude. Stoked, dude. Radical. Can't wait. You should say cowbunga. Every other sentence <laughs> should be cowbunga. Okay. So, have you got any good stories for us today? I mean, I only have you on the pod, mm. and you've only reluctantly become the I don't know frequent guest, collaborator, mm. co host and director. I think we decided on what you were. I just won't leave. Yeah. No, you, I know. <laughs> can't get rid of me. I can't. <laughs> I tried starting a podcast without you and hoping yeah. you'd get the hint. You Every Wednesday, I just show up and open the door and make it like come in yeah, yeah. as we all know and the mm-hmm. listeners know they only can stand your voice they dm me every other day every, every single gosh darn day <laughs> got any ghost stories for us i do have a ghost story actually <gasps> yeah well okay Which, I, I was actually kind of expecting you to say no no i'm actually very excited about it because like they, okay. I, I i feel like i haven't had a good one for a while yeah i've been sitting on this for a little bit You're so sitting on it. well it's pretty You're holding it yeah well it's, it's 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 good it's not like um i'll just tell the story okay, okay. you know what? i'll stop interrupting so happened earlier on the week my daughter and my wife, they'd already left. My wife for work, my daughter left for crash, so I was in the house on my own. It was around seven and a half, seven-ish, and I heard a massive crash in the bathroom, which this has happened before. Okay. And it's usually because Salem's coming in through the window. Right. And like when he comes in through the window, that's where our um, a windowsill is. Yeah. So it knocks over all the shampoos, bottles and all the all fall over. So it's happened before. He's come in and I have to run in to get him out of the house and he, he runs off the little scamp. Yeah. And he <laughs> runs under the bed and I have to get him out. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. So I, I was in your house before and he snuck in and it took us a while to get him out. He does. Yeah. No, he, yeah. He's a little bugger. He won't leave. I'm not even. Yeah. He's like, this is my house. <laughs> I'm k- k- kicking you out. So here I was like, fuck, Salem. So I was like, I got up and I legged it to the bathroom. Uh-huh. Wasn't there. Window wasn't even open. And there was, yeah, I, all the shampoo bottles, not all of them, like half of them, uh, were the shampoo bottles and conditioners and all that jazz in, in the bath. No idea how, wow. how they ended up there. I haven't got a clue. And especially because like, it wasn't, I rushed in so quick because I need to get that cat out of the house. Yeah. So I heard it jumped up and ran into the room. Yeah. And there was nothing there, no breeze, no nothing. The window was closed. Nothing was on the floor? Well, it was, it was, it was in the bath. Oh, like, sorry. All, all the stuff, yeah, yeah, stuff had yeah, fallen yeah, from yeah, the windowsill yeah, yeah. in, 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 yeah. into the bath. Yep. No explanation. No idea how it happened. But uh, yeah. Well. Didn't, didn't see anything. Didn't see any ghosts. Yeah. But uh, yeah. It's, in, in, another one of those unexplained well, phenomena. Interesting. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, Keith's shampoo, his luscious <laughs> conditioners, and whatever else he uses for his <laughs> long hair are falling into the bath. Yeah. We, we, things are just getting scarier and scarier is. in Casa del Keith. We should, you know, we should. Do? I'm sick of shampoo. We should boycott shampoo. Yeah. Demand the real poo. None of the sham stuff. <laughs> oh, this is why I wanted to start. That was all a setup for that joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it feels like it. Do you know what we need to do, by the way, yeah, uh, for your house? Yeah. By the way, okay, somebody messaged me. I can't remember where the message, but they said that you shouldn't do a Ouija board by yourself. Nah, I'm gonna do it. You can't tell me what to do. I'm a bit of a badass. <laughs> you shouldn't do it by yourself. My dad told me you should never do a Ouija board. Oh. And I like you. Like, oh well, that person dad said emailed it. in. <laughs> like, Screw them. <laughs> yeah, this is what my dad does. Anyway. But also, uh, but you know what we should do is okay. do like a ghost adventures uh, style night. In your house. Oh, okay, yeah. You can get night vision cameras. Oh, yeah. EVP recorders. Yeah, yeah. I'll be the Zach Baggins. You okay. can be one of the other people. <laughs> you can be the chick or whatever. Great, yeah. And I can go, I have oh the my hair. God, the evilest presence I've ever felt is in this room. Huh, and horrible. shocked what comes next. You know, I can't wait to do that. It's going to be great. Let's definitely do that. Yeah. Oh, we should have to do that. Oh, man, yeah. I can't believe it. And you know, it's like, oh, I feel a dark presence over here in the corner. And it's like, yeah, it'd be great. I'll get dust my, in the, in the, my the, wife and daughter out of the house. Already saying, they'd be, they'd be proud of it. That'd be great. We should definitely do that. I'm psyched. We can even make a little video out of it. Yeah, but even the, the, the like ah, sound effects, you yeah, know, yeah. like the spooky music and shit. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah hell yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Done. Sold. Sold. Okay. And my wife, she listens Check to this. Please. I know. 
Get out of the house. Okay, get out of the house. Get out of the house now. You have five minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of haunted houses, mm-hmm. today, that's exactly what we are talking about on today's episode of the That Chapter podcast. Folks, you know, we recently we've been talking about, well, you know, the listener stories is always sprinkled in. We talked about some true crime, uh, unsolved mysteries in Europe, the Brabant Killers. Mm. That was a good one. That I was good. I really enjoyed that, yeah. So we've done killers, we've yep. done UFOs, we've done whatever we did before then. Mm-hmm. And we've also got a cult October coming up. We want to yes. see cryptid soon. we got yeah. more vampires and horrors yeah. and serial killers and all the good stuff. The usual Dutch after horror stuff. Hmm. Today, though, we're talking ghosts. We're getting into the spooky side of things with the story of the Black Monk of Pontefract. Mm. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but you know what? It's how I'm going to pronounce it. Sounds if I'm good. Honest. Sounds good. Thank you. Dubbed by some as the most violent poltergeist in the world. I actually didn't even say it, say it like that. <laughs> uh, dubbed by some as the most violent poltergeist in the world. Mm. This one and the under, the one down there. Oh. Like all, all the worlds. I see all what you did the there. Nice. Yeah, well, you know, it's on par with your shampoo jokes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Soon you'll go to my level, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you there. You're dragging me down with you. So uh, it's pretty bold to claim, but by the end of this episode of the TCP, mm-hmm. That Chapter Podcast, you might just find yourself agreeing. In fact, I guarantee that you will. We can sell you on it. We'll Ma- sell you. Mike can sell on. Oh, I'll sell you. I'll sell to you. Don't worry about that. The notorious case of alleged, no, scratch out alleged, definite poltergeist activity (laughs) unfolded at 30 East Drive, a seemingly ordinary house in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, England. That's the Yorkshire accent, right? That's more Liverpoolian, is it? Is it? You can't remember Beatles there with it. Oh. Where are they from? Liverpool. Oh. Where is this? Yorkshire. Is that far from Liverpool? Uh, I'm way, uh... English geography is not the best. Well, anyway, it happened. Yeah, it's somewhere in England. Somewhere, you know, there in the north part of England, I believe. Sure. I can just hear English people who are listening to this episode <laughs> screaming at us right Turning now. Turning it off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have to shit we come out with is just to annoy people. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. We deliberately get uh, things wrong. It's pretty engagement, folks. Yeah, let's say that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all planned. It's all, yeah. We're definitely doing We're not really purpose. idiots. Uh, yeah. You sure about that? You sure about that? And this was during the 19, the late uh, 1960s, if you can believe that. The haunting at 30 East Drive is renowned not only for its intensity, but also for its extensive documentation. This this one was in the newspapers, mm, if you can it was, believe it. Yeah. I found that out. So, uh, oh man, I love I love a good ghost story. Yeah, yeah. You can't beat it. This is as good as it, good as it gets. Yeah, this is as good as it gets, folks. I would I'd never even heard of it before. Actually, I'd heard of like a lot of the other famous ones. Like there's a, the other famous English uh, poltergeist story, the Enfield one, mm, yeah, yeah. which we were thinking about doing. It's been done a lot. We might mm. get around to it eventually. Sure, we could put our own twist in it. Yeah. Uh, what other uh, Amityville is probably like probably the most famous poltergeist mm, story, yeah, yeah, which yeah. we did cover. We did. Yeah. Although for that one, we covered more the uh, murders. The murders. Before the murders around, are yeah. more interesting than the actual ghost stories, are, though. Yeah, I yeah, find. Yeah, yeah. And other famous, the movie Poltergeist. True. Yeah. That's yeah. a famous poltergeist. Yeah. There's a movie about this. One. We'll get into oh, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it looks shit. <laughs> so the last, uh, the, but yeah, the last uh, ghost story we did was the Greenbrier ghost. Oh yeah, that was good. So if you guys like paranormal, you're in for a hoot. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, we're pretty excited for Halloween, mm. so we love to get to this paranormal stuff. So what really happened is this. To set the scene is a family called the Pritchard family lived in this house, and they experienced a series of terrifying events that would soon become infamous. From the sudden appearance of a dark hooded figure, the eponymous black monk, to furniture flying across rooms and unexplainable noises echoing throughout the halls, the disturbances were relentless. And at times, they done got physical. Those who witnessed the haunting, including the Pritchards, their neighbors, and paranormal investigators, reported events that were truly baffling. And this is in fact going on to this to this very day, folks, if you can believe that. It's still going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that at the end. So their stories, filled with fear and disbelief, continued to captivate the imaginations of paranormal enthusiasts and skeptics alike. In fact, the legend of the Black Monk of Pontefract has lived on through countless books, documentaries, and even a 2012 feature film called When the Lights Went Out. Keith, have you yeah. seen When the Lights Went Out, the famous, most famous film of 2012? I've seen bits of it just while I was researching this. Yeah. Um, I think they got the, uh, like, they got the house pretty accurate, on not they? The house kind of looks yeah. like, it. yeah, um, I have not seen it myself either. The mm. reviews were not kind. Oh, really? But okay. then again, your horror movies tend to be uh, usually reviewed harsher. Mm. 
yeah, I find yeah. than regular movies, which yeah. kind of always sucks. Like usually horror movies generally score lower, yeah. which is unfair in my opinion yeah. a lot of times. But um, hey, listen, anybody out there seen the flick? Let us know. I did I watch will... the trailer. Yeah, and I actually will say like from the trailer as well, what they show in the trailer, it seems pretty true to what... It's accurate. The, it is. Yeah. Like, the events actually happened yeah. in the trailer is what happened in real life. So It is, it is. Yeah, I'll give them that. Hey, bonus points for, uh, you know, authenticity. <laughs> but I, it, to me, it just looked kind of like a cheap... Conjuring knockoff. Yeah, yeah. For any Last of the Mohicans uh, fans out there, though, it stars the British guy from that movie, Duncan. Oh, okay. Uh, I love... It's an odd reference, I know, folks. But uh, I love The Last of the Mohicans. It's like one of my favorite movies. So he's the he's like the dad in the movie. Okay, cool, cool. Anyways, so uh, without further ado, let's dive into the chilling details of this haunting, which is a lot scarier than the movie it is based on. This is the story of the Black Monk of Pontefract. I think we should like set the scene a little bit. Oh, get a bit of get a bit of history in. Keith, you can't beat a good old scene setting. You know I always say that. <laughs> my famous quote. You do always say that. Mm-hmm. So many places believed to be haunted, they often have a history of trauma or tragedy, such as murders, battles, or you know, like just accidents. Shit yes. just happens. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Pontefract is it's no exception. With it has a long and bloody past stretching right back to Roman times, which only adds to the reputation for the paranormal activity which we're seeing in yeah. this story. So Pontefract Castle, that was built around 1070 and is just a short 20 minute walk from the haunted house that we're talking about today. There's nothing in ghost miles. No, 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 especially on a ghost bike. Mm -hmm. No, on your performance. (laughs) 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 That got got me. (laughs) So in its prime, this castle, it was one of the most important castles in medieval England. Nowadays, it's mostly in ruins, so it's a bit... (laughs) It's not about a ghost bike. It's so stupid. <laughs> You're laughing at your own Love joke? Your own joke. I'm trying not to laugh at myself. Damn it. <laughs> Keith, you, you did it again. Fuck. You madman. Okay, I think it's that smoke that's in his room. Gone. Yeah, okay. oh, for folks at home, uh, I got a mist machine, like a fog machine. Um, so I'm sure a lot of folks know at home, but where I record the videos, it's the same place where we record the podcast. So I got a fog machine because I thought it might be cool, you know, in the videos at least, yeah, to yeah. have like mist in the background mm. when the camera's on me and yeah. I'm telling the story. So I sprayed a shit out of it. I, you got like an industrial smoke machine as well. Yeah, but this I isn't like for a, a house. small one. It's I huge. It, I know. It's, it's, hey, listen, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> I don't know anything about smoke machines. So it's got like a, a one that was reasonably priced that yeah. I seen. So I, I gave it a good old whack anyway while he was here. And I think it was sprayed directly into his face. <laughs> yeah. So uh, That's hey, funny what it is, I yeah. put it on my, you know, I put it on uh, my Instagram story. Yeah. So if, uh, let me think, if three weeks ago you seen something about smoke uh, fog machine on my Instagram smoke now, poisoning yeah. there you know there you literally go. sat down you're like hey check this out <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway okay back to the story yes so the castle so nowadays it is it's mostly in ruins so it's a bit tricky to imagine how grand it once was uh, so despite its current state this stone fortress it had a formidable reputation and it was a key player in many historical events earning a prominent place in local history so over the years the Pontefract castle has been the site of significant drama and death It was the scene of Richard II's mysterious death in the 1400s and was heavily involved during the War of the Roses with numerous soldiers meeting their end or being imprisoned in his dungeons. Ooh. So speaking of dungeons, Pontefract, it actually has a network of them carved into the rock beneath the castle. I think at one point it used to be like a wine cellar and then like during like the Civil War, so like... Like, in you get. Yeah, we need to put these soldiers somewhere, so just shove them down there. Yeah, he'll drink all the wine. So the prisoners, they, they were kept in the dark in these winding cells for extended periods. Uh, you can actually still see, you can go visit the dungeons now. You can see the prisoners' names uh, scratched and etched into the dungeon walls when you visit the castle today. <gasps> There's a couple of names that are etched like n- numerous times. They must be down there for like ages and like yeah. no, no better to do. Uh, but yeah. Or is this just different guys with the same name? Yeah, could be. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. it's more like... Maybe, yeah, it's more like, what I, was I just really want people to know I was here, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the castle also shows, it also saw a lot of action during the English Civil War from 1642 to 1651, including intense sieges. So this place, it definitely has a rich and bloody history. Today's story, however, doesn't centre around the ghost of a fallen soldier or a poor forgotten soul in the dark dungeons. Instead, legend has it that the ghost of a cluniac monk, he murdered and raped young girls, disposing of their bodies in a well during the time of Henry VIII in 1509 to 1547. Now, however, this is an intriguing story. It's, it's more folklore than historical facts. I wasn't able to find that to confirm this. Even though there was indeed a 
Pontefract Priory, or like a monastery, which was founded around 1090, right beside Pontefract Castle. Uh, but yeah, as I said, there's no historical evidence that a monk from this priory committed such crimes. However, there is a well, and you'll never guess what house is built right on top of that well. Oh, oh my house? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Folks. So that's an interesting backstory. He's got a long and bloody history. Mm. The English, they loved some good old medieval wars. They did. They loved beating the shite out of each other. And this is prime, this is prime, prime location. This is a prime beef location for where they did that. So uh, haunted question mark. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. Exclamation point. Mm-hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. So the tale of the black monk of Pontefract famously haunted the Pritchard family. But booty, big booty. Today's story actually begins with the family who came before them. Mm. The Farrers. See, the ghost was there from the very beginning. <gasps> oh, my days. Mm-hmm. So William Farrer, known as Bill, returned from military service in 1947, and he got himself engaged to Barbara in 1948, and they married in 1950. Due to their limited finances, they were fortunate to qualify for government-assisted housing as subsidized by council house, and so they are placed on the waiting list. This was post-war England, and like most places post-war, houses were springing up. So it was two and a half years after the birth of their first child for Bill and Barbara, that's when they finally got a house. The house they got, they were given, was the very last house built on East Drive, number 30. So I know the likely reason that their house, number 30 East Drive, was the very last one to be built was because a large stone well was located exactly where the plans designated the last semi-detached house, number 30. Therefore, it made the house the most difficult to build. Mm. You're building right on top of a well. Yeah, save the worst to last. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Also, even after the house was completed, well, 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 damp (laughs) issues persisted. So the house had to be lifted and the well capped, a process witnessed by several people. So there was definitely a well under here. Mm -hmm. Maybe a spooky haunted well. There was a lot of witnesses that seen this well. So when they dug up the floors, there was like builders. There was a couple of kids from around the area. Uh, When they dug it up, there was like a a gang of kids and they dared each other to go down the well a little little bit. And one of the guys, he kind of got down to where the builders were going. And he's like, fuck this, got like scared and got out. But one of the builders, he also found like a gold ring down the bottom of the well. And he took that home. Nice. It could be a haunted ring. Who knows? More than likely. Now, they moved in to this house September 1954, becoming the very first occupants of 30 East Drive. Just to describe the house so that people can imagine it, uh, it's a two-story red-bricked semi-detached home. Like, if you're looking at the place, you know, there's an identical house to the left, Mm. none on the right, it's a semi-detached home. It's not a bad-looking house. It's Honestly, very unassuming from the outside. It yeah. is, exactly. You know, there's a small garden uh, with a short wall, and then you're on, like, the main, the main uh, footpath. Then there's grass for a bit, and then there's a roundabout directly mm. opposite the home. And all the houses, yeah, in this area, they look pretty much the exact same, just mm. red-bricked standard semi-detached yeah. houses like it's, it's a very unremarkable area like this story is horrifying but like you would drive through this neighborhood and not think twice yep. about it it's like yeah it's grand hmm? whatever which i think kind of almost makes it more horrifying yeah. it's like it's such an as you say it's such an unassuming yeah. house you would just walk by it without even looking at yeah. it kind of like, like hiding in plain sight yeah, yeah. that's how they get you so right from the very start when the farers moved in they encountered problems in their new home It was always cold. No matter what they tried, they could never warm up the house. There was an allotment out the back that they could never get anything to grow in. The side gate would not stay shut. When a large brick was put in place to keep it closed, the gate would still open. They also noticed that objects would go missing or get moved around the home. Most concerning, however, was the effect the new house seemed to have on their two-year-old daughter, Jane, who just seemed to never settle in this house. Bill, he worked uh, several part-time jobs, right? So he would leave Barbara and Jane alone in the home for for quite a long time. Barbara, she would spend a lot of time out with Jane, going for walks, visiting her mother, visiting family, friends, and Jane would be happy as a two-year-old girl can be. But as soon as they would set foot inside 30 East Drive, Jane, nah, nah, she wasn't having it. She had become visibly unsettled, uh, distressed. We've we've actually spoken about this before, Keith, a couple of times about how kids can sometimes see or sense things that uh, other people it's cannot. True. Yeah, it yeah. seems like young Jane knew something was wrong in the home before anybody else did. Mm. Whatever was in there knew that Jane knew because things took a dark turn when bloody marks and scratches started showing up on little Jane's face. Initially, they thought she might be scratching herself in her sleep, which can sometimes happen. 
so they put little cotton mittens on her hands at night. However, the scratches kept appearing <gasps> despite Ooh, this. Spooky. Yeah. No, I hear you're barking, big dog, but there are no big dogs or any pets, cats, anything like that. They didn't have any pets in the home at all. Scratches and cuts also began to appear on the hood of Jane's toy pram while nobody was at home. The scratches as well, they'd always, like, appear in trees. They were like yeah. claws, you know? Ooh, yeah. like a tree-fingered demon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, 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 I said, like, they appeared in the hood, but did also see them, like, in furniture as well, like, on our couch, just, like, oh, wow. a couple of scrapes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, very creepy. It's, it reminds me of uh, Paranormal Activity. Remember mm. when he puts down the flower or whatever, or the thing, and then yeah. you can see the footprints of the demon? Yeah, yeah, And it's, like, yeah. a weird footprint. Mm. That's cool. I mean, not cool, but kind of cool. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean. So things reached a breaking point when Barbara heard Jane screaming from upstairs. Rushing up the stairs, she found Jane crying with a pillow over her face. This incident was the final straw. Determined to find a solution, Barbara went to the council to request a move to another house. And on Barbara's way, she ran into, guess who? Jean Pritchard. Jean, how are you doing? <laughs> Just running away from my haunted house. And guess what? After a brief conversation between Barbara Farrer and Jean Pritchard, wasn't Jean just also annoyed at her house? You're running out of your house because you have a ghost? No shit, me too. Small <laughs> <Yeah>. world! <laughs> Literally, that was it. That was they it, They both yeah. complained that both their houses were haunted, and so Barbara suggested, do you want to swap houses? Jean eagerly accepted the idea, thinking she was getting a great deal, because not only did Turdy East Drive offer her and her family more space, unbeknownst to Barbara, Jean was also trying to escape the ghost of a young girl haunting her home. Every house in England is haunted, uh, apparently, according mm. to the story. Well, I think that was the thing in these houses. Like, there was a lot of hauntings on that road. And they reckon, I'm going to get, I'll get into it in a little bit with ghosts and poltergeists and energy. Like, one of the things poltergeists say, like, pull energy from, like, children and adolescents because there's, like, so much, their, their hormones are going mad. But another thing <laughs> they did pull energy from and the is... the poltergeist hormones? Or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the other thing that they pull energy from is water. Mm -hmm. So there's, like, the well underneath the well, thing, but yeah. it's also that water is coming from somewhere so they reckon like it could be like a water source under the houses and mm. the poltergeist or the ghosts whatever they would like draw the energy and kind of travel throughout the houses within yeah the like an underground stream yeah, yeah. as well mm. Mm. Yeah. Keith you are you're a one of a kind you know that you're a diamond <laughs> in a rough with the ideas that you got so essentially anyway Barbara and Jean decided to switch ghost for ghost mm. in the end the two families swapped houses thinking they were escaping their respective hauntings Unfortunately, though, the Farrers got the better end of the deal. The Pritchard family, well, the ghost at Turdy East Drive turned out to be far more violent than they could have ever imagined. Yeah, I wonder if they did actually talk about the hauntings or they were just saying they were just not settling into the house. They just weren't happy yeah. with it. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm not like mine either. And it's like, oh, we should swap from the two of them. Oh, sucker. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> yeah. guarantee it's probably like something like that. Speaking of ghosts and poltergeists, so I guess we like before before we should before we get into the whole meat and potatoes of today's story, mm -hmm. I think it's worth quickly clarifying the difference between a ghost and a poltergeist, so we know exactly what we're dealing with here. Yes, well, here, listen, we're not amateurs. Exactly, I'll yeah. say that for mm -hmm. nothing. We've done the research. Yes. So, in the world of the paranormal, there's mm -hmm. there's many types of ghosts, generally falling into two categories. So there's interactive, and then there's non-interactive. So, um, interactive ghosts. So, they are probably the most commonly understood type. So, these ghosts are often the spirits of deceased humans, usually someone known to the observer, such as a friend or a family member. Uh, these ghosts, they make themselves, they can make themselves vi visible or manifest. Uh, they can be heard audibly or telepathically and even touch the living as well. Mm -hmm. So, some ghosts can even produce odours like tobacco or perfume that are often associated with them when they're alive. Mm. I think we told a story about that before on the podcast where, on the, on the listener stories, when someone, I think it was their grandfather or something, yeah, they, they got a smell of tobacco and was like, oh, he used yeah. to smoke when he was playing guitar. When he was playing guitar, exactly. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say, this sounds like the ghosts that people talk about when they're, when they talk about their own experiences, yet yeah, these are... Mm. So the ghosts, they get all the senses. Yeah. So there are also um, other types of interactive ghosts, uh, personalities, such as like anonymous ghosts, just ghosts. You, just, you don't know who they are. They're not, they're not a family member or mm -hmm. historical ghosts like Abraham Lincoln or something. You yeah, know? yeah. Then there's these non-interactive ghosts, on the other hand. So they lack awareness of the living and they tend to repeat 
the same actions like like you'll see them walking down the stairs or sitting on the edge of a bed and it's as if they're like actors in a play being performed over and over and over mm. again many people who've encountered these types of non-interactive ghosts they describe them as like watching a f- few frames of a movie in like a continuous loop like, like yeah. a, a boomerang yeah like a boomerang like mm. you're stuck in a time loop so broadly speaking there is like three types of hauntings there is haunted places haunted objects and haunted people most cases labelled as poltergeist, they tend to fall under the category of haunted people. So one of the most popular beliefs about poltergeist outbreaks is that they usually centre around a child or a teenager, which is what I was saying earlier, who are on the brink of puberty. This theory holds that because such children are like emotionally volatile and undergo complex hormonal changes, some form of psychic energy is generated and the energy can power the often terrifying phenomena that can occur. Yeah. And you see this in a lot of cases of poltergeist activities. There's usually a child or a teenager in the house going through these changes. And yeah, the poltergeists are known for their tendency to move and in many cases like hurl objects around the room, hide small trinkets from the living and produce a series of noises, usually like a loud bang or a rapping on the wall. They are capable of some more dangerous stunts as well, such as pushing people over and even starting small fires. Bastards. I know. So while instances of someone being injured by a poltergeist, they're extremely rare, their ability to frighten people can actually lead to traumatic problems. So the poltergeist won't actually do with the injury. It's usually someone gets a scare and either like their ticker gives out or they go to run and they fall. Yeah. That's usually what happens. But in the case of the black monk, many believe they believe the poltergeist due to the nature of the paranormal experiences. However, as mentioned, poltergeists, they very rarely harm people. And those who do get hurt, as I said, is often due to shock. So the black monk, he defies these assumptions becoming so violent that it caused serious physical injury. And this has led some to believe that it's neither a ghost or a poltergeist, but something far more sinister, a demon. So unlike ghosts and poltergeists, which were once human, demons have never walked the earth as living beings and they exist purely to cause chaos. In August of 1966, the Pritchard family, that's our second family to inhabit 30 East Drive. You got mom Jean, you got dad Joe, and their 15-year-old son Philip and 12-year-old daughter Diane. They had just swapped houses with the Farrer family and got the raw end of the deal. They did indeed. They would have wished they had that little girl ghost or wherever it was Mm. haunting them in their first house. So Jean, Joe, and Diane decided to make the most of the August bank holiday weekend when they were moving in by heading off to a seaside resort in Devon, that's in the south of England. Philip, who was at an age when family holidays they weren't exactly exciting, he opted to stay at home in 30 East Drive with, uh, with his grandmother, Sarah. And the decision to stay at home marked the beginning of the hauntings. See, one day, Sarah was sitting on the couch, chilling, hmm. knitting away. Doing what grannies do. Knitting a sweater or whatever they do. When Philip came in from the garden where he'd been reading a book, he noticed something strange around his grandmother as he walked in the dough. Mm. A fine chalk-like powder seemed to be falling inside the living room. Not from the ceiling, though, but starting a couple of feet below it. It was weird. It was like the, the dust was falling essentially out of midair. Mm-hmm. I think the ground was just like the scar face covered. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you want to go for a run? <laughs> <laughs> Philip and Sarah briefly considered it might have drifted in from outside through a window. But as the particles continued to appear and cover everything in a white residue, reminiscent of, of like a volcanic ash or snowflakes, this theory seemed less and less plausible. It was definitely strange, but not something that immediately screamed ghostly behavior. <laughs> so Philip and his grandmother, Sarah, unable to find an explanation for the, for the white powder, decided to just clean it up. You know, it was, hmm. we'll have a, have a cup of tea and just wait for it all to blow over. I'm sure it's nothing. They headed to the kitchen for cleaning supplies, only to discover there was something else wrong in the kitchen. Small pools of water all over the kitchen floor. Sarah asked Philip if he had spilled anything, to which he replied, he had not. They got a mop and began to clean up the water, but it seemed like every time they mopped up one pool, another would appear. At first, they thought there might be a leak somewhere, but they couldn't locate the source. They considered the possibility that the water was coming up from under the linoleum floor, but when they pulled it back, the ground was bone dry. Assuming it to be a leaky pipe, they called in a plumber, However, after checking all the drains, pipes, and sewage, the plumber was also baffled as to the source of of these pools of water. The best explanation he could offer was that the pools of water might be due to humidity, even though he himself seemed that that was probably, uh, well, bullshit. 
how humid can it get that literal pools of water like yeah. the Amazon rainforest I think it has to yeah, that level right. of humidity and especially like they reappear so often like that yeah. and it was a very dry week as well yeah week. right so the pools uh, of water they continued to appear after the plumber left but then just like the white powder they suddenly stopped and disappeared after about an hour Later that evening, Philip and his grandmother were watching TV when they heard a strange sound and knocks coming from the hallway. Upon investigating, they found that the potted plant, which usually sat at the bottom of the stairs, had been removed from its pot and it was now halfway up the staircase. The pot itself was sitting at the top of the stairs. Oh, I don't don't like that at all. As they were processing this, another noise startled them coming from the kitchen. Fearing an intruder, they rushed to the kitchen and saw that the crockery cupboard was shaking and vibrating violently as if someone was inside. However, as soon as Philip opened the cupboard doors, the shaking stopped. Then around 9.30pm, they decided to call it a night. Philip went to bed and Sarah followed shortly after to give him a goodnight smoocheroony. <laughs> as she approached, she noticed Philip staring in terror over her shoulder. This is terrifying. Yeah, Imagine right. just coming in and it seemed like staring at something. Yeah. See, the wardrobe in the corner of the room was swaying and it was moving on its own. Without hesitation, Sarah told Philip to get dressed because they were leaving. The pair spent the rest of the night at a neighbor's house. When he actually, when he arrived at the home of the neighbors, Marie and Vic Kelly, they explained what had happened. Where Vic, the husband, he's very skeptical. He was convinced that someone must have been in the house. So he actually decided to call the police. Yeah. And the police, they arrived about 10 minutes later and they conducted like a a full search of the house, but they didn't find any evidence of a break in or signs of an intruder. So without like any signs of criminal activity and ghosts not being within their jurisdiction, the officers, they just left. Nothing we can do. Yep. Not my problem. Yeah. So when Philip and his grandmother, they got back to the house the following afternoon, all was quiet at home. And when Jean, Joe and Diane returned from their little kind of short holiday, long uh, long weekend, a few days later, they were told about the strange events that had happened while they were away. And they were very skeptical of the whole story and suspected some bullshit was happening. Then when Joe asked, what kind of knocks, you know, were you hearing? As if in reply, tree, loud... Bangs echoed throughout the house, and the temperature in the room suddenly dropped. After a couple of minutes, the temperature returned to normal. Oh, nice. <laughs> the polar guys' activity then ceased. Uh, kind of yeah. stopped. That was about yeah. it. That was that's yeah. was not so bad. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, thanks for <laughs> listening, folks. Uh, appreciate it. Leave. Oh, wait, wait, no. <laughs> it ceased for two years oh. because, folks. That was just the, uh, the, that wasn't even the appetizer. That was the, um... Amuse-bouche. That's the word I was looking for, yes. That was the amuse-bouche of the shit going down. After two years, that's when the poltergeist really arrived. So after a two-year hiatus, the paranormal activity started up again. And the poltergeist would now go on to torment the whole Pritchard family for about nine months. However... It seemed to take a particular liking to Diane, who had now reached her mid-teens. Mm-hmm. Just like you were saying, ghosts focusing on teens, teen girls maybe specifically. Mm-hmm. High energy. Mm-hmm. At first, it was just noises and knocks, and they thought it might have been you know, from the neighbors, as they you know lived in a semi-detached house, so they would have shared a wall. But then, one night, while the family was sleeping, Jean woke up to a noise coming from the landing. When she went out to investigate, she didn't see anything unusual, except for the painting materials at the end of the hall she had been using earlier that same day to redecorate Diane's room. But once again, suddenly, the temperature dropped. She could see a shadow moving in the hall, so she quickly turned on the lights. And as soon as she did, something flew past her face, narrowly missing her. It was the paintbrush from the end of the hall. Then came the paint bucket, which hit the wall beside her. Jean screamed for her husband, Joe, who came out to see what the, what the noise was about, followed shortly by Philip and Diane, who also emerged from their rooms to find out what was happening in the hall. As they stood there, paint materials began flying around as if they were thrown by an invisible force. Then they heard a series of bangs coming from Diane's room. When Philip looked in, he witnessed the wooden curtain fixture being ripped off the wall and thrown out the window. Joe quickly slammed Dan's door shut. From inside, they could hear bangs and thumps. 
Diane spent that night in her parents' room, although I don't think any of them got much sleep that night. Little did they know, it was only a taste of what was to come. These things happened almost every night. Interestingly, they didn't really happen during the day when Diane was at school. The noise usually kicked off around bedtime with a series of loud bangs. Ornaments would float and fly across the room and family photos would get slashed and torn up. The lights would go out, and when they checked the cupboard under the stairs, the main switch would be off. One time, Jean Pritchard taped the switch you know, into an on position with insulating tape. Half an hour later, the lights were off once again, and the tape had mysteriously disappeared. This happened so often that the Pritchard family started calling the poltergeist Fred. Fred, that's good nice. Name. Fred is a good name. Ah, Fred. Yeah, it was around this time as well that they actually contacted their local vicar, Reverend Davy. He called around to the house one evening for a cup of tea to chat about what had been happening. He actually initially suggested performing an exorcism, which is usually a practice held for getting rid of like demons and requires yeah. the permission of the bishop. So uh -huh. quite, it's quite extreme. It's it's out there. Oh yeah, you can't just like get an exorcism willy nilly. Oh no no you no! You gotta go through the. You gotta do it by the book. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So to be honest, I don't think Reverend Davy. I don't. I think he was completely over his head and he didn't really know what he was dealing with here. Especially if you kind of throw out an exorcism, which is yeah, done like on a, people. It's like, what do we do? Oh, exorcism! Yeah, I'll exorcise the house. Why? Not. Yeah. Fuck it. So as they were talking through, a small candlestick suddenly fell off the mantelpiece. And apparently the Reverend had a degree in engineering also, because as soon as it happened, he confidently said that their issue was subsidence. It's like, oh, your house is fucked. Your house is sinking. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's a shit house. Yeah. yeah, it's a shit house. Problem solved. Yeah. But as soon as he said that, though, the other candlestick rose up from the shelf, floated across in front of the vicar's nose, and then dropped to the floor, to which the Reverend had changed his advice and told him, you should leave this house before he got up and left himself. All right, see you, bye. Yeah, okay, bye. <laughs> All right, you guys are on your own. Oh, but the exorcism. Oh, see. Yeah, you guys will figure it out. I, I have faith in you. You got it, you got it. Yeah. So maybe they should have taken his advice. I mean, why didn't they? Like, seriously, they're, they they got to the stage where this becomes so normalized that they give the ghost a name. I, I, you couldn't sleep in his house. You just go insane. Mm. I think they're like just pure Yorkshire people. Just like, you know, stubborn. Uh, it's, it's what I've like, I've kind of looked uh, on uh, multiple documentaries and kind of books I've written about it. Okay. It's like, yeah, they're like, just stubborn. It's like, it's my house. I'm yeah. not the having a ghost kick me out. out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Fair, well, fair play to them. One evening, as Diane was heading upstairs to bed, the lights suddenly went out. And then a huge shadow appeared on the wall and the atmosphere in the home turned icy. The hall stand, which was a heavy piece of oak furniture, floated into the air and moved towards her. Diane tripped and fell backwards on the stairs and the stand, it somehow managed to press down upon her, holding her in place. It didn't press with all its weight, but she was firmly pinned to the stairs. She tried to push it away, but it would not budge. When the lights came back on, she screamed. I like how she screamed when the lights came back. She didn't scream before. She I know, yeah. To the stairs. <laughs> oh, now it's great. <laughs> her family rushed out into the hall and her mom tried to drag the stand off her, but it was impossible. The stand was held in place by an unseen force stronger than any of them. Philip and Joe, they began to heave on it, but nothing worked. Mrs. Pritchard advised Diane to lie still and try to relax. And as soon as she did, Diane felt a change in the force holding her down. Now try, she said, and as they pulled, the stand came off her. Have you tried letting go of the stand? <laughs> holding it on top of her, so... <laughs> But the poltergeist wasn't done with her yet. Later that night, Diane was dragged out of the bed four separate times and found herself pinned to the ground with her mattress on top of her. That's scary. It's like that it scene is. in uh, Paranormal Activity once again. Yeah, yeah. It's scary shit. It is. I feel about four times, but like, oh, not again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the stairs was actually, it was a huge major hotspot of the activity in the house. So one afternoon, a neighbor came over to visit Jean Pritchard for a cup of tea, a cup of cha. And the two women, they were standing at the foot of the stairs, uh, having a bit of a chat, a bit of a chin wag. When suddenly a grandmother clock on the upstairs landing, it started swaying from side to side. Then out of nowhere, the clock just fell forward down the stairs and just smashed the pieces right where they were standing just seconds before. So they had to like jump out of the way to avoid getting hurt. And this was, it was a heavy clock. It could have really seriously injured them. But yeah. Yeah, there's been multiple paranormal activity on the stairs. Like people who would like guess who'd be in the house to be walking up the stairs, they'd feel something like push them, mm. push by them as they're walking up. But yeah, a lot of activity Damn. happened on the stairs. Yeah. yeah. There were so many like strange things happening in this house that we could literally go on forever listening mm. to them. It was, it was constant. But here are some of the most memorable events of their time. 
Once, Jean Pritchard heard a weird buzzing noise coming from her wardrobe in the master bedroom. When she opened it, a swarm of bees, not the bees, came pouring out and she ended up getting stung quite badly. That scene is in the was in the trailer for the yeah, movie. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Another day, Jean was having tea and sandwiches with a friend while watching the TV in the front room. Suddenly, the lights went out and things started flying around in the dark. When the lights came back on, the room was a mess. Ornaments and cushions were scattered everywhere. The sandwich plate was still on the table, but sandwiches, it was empty. At first, it seemed like the sandwiches had just simply vanished, but we woke sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> Raging. Then, Jean spotted a few of them behind the TV. When she picked one up, her friend asked what was wrong. Jean showed her the sandwich, which had a huge bite taken out of it, complete with visible teeth marks. Whoever had bitten it must have had enormous teeth. Mm. Kind of like, it's just, it just reminds me of like a toddler like eating her sandwich, kind of hiding behind a TV, <laughs> yeah. eating her sandwich. Yeah, crouching from yeah. the yeah. <laughs> The poltergeist also had a knack for making things appear out of tin air. One evening, as the Pritchards were sitting in the lounge, an egg floated in through the door, hovered in midair, and then fell to the floor. Can I offer you an egg in this yeah. trying time? <laughs> yeah. When another egg floated into the room, Jean rushed to the fridge, put all the eggs into a wooden box, and sat on it, thinking she had outsmarted uh, the poltergeist. Try and get the eggs now, bitch. <laughs> but when another egg materialized and exploded, she checked the box and found an egg was missing. Mm. How is it? It's disappearing. It's a magic trick. This happened repeatedly until all the eggs were broken on the floor and the box was empty, Keith. Mm, spooky. Mm. They also said, as she also says, well, when the eggs exploded, they got like a massive like floral smell. Remember what I was saying earlier that ghosts can sometimes, uh, you get like per- a perfume smell or yeah. floral. Yeah, but that was one of the things they mentioned as well. So the egg would float, explode, they get a massive floral smell and it'd be disappeared from the box. That's weird. Was Isn't there a floral smell inside the egg? I don't know. Oh my God. Yeah. Baffling. Keith, yeah. this is baffling. <laughs> There was also the mystery of the keys. One morning, while Jean was cleaning out the fireplace, a bunch of keys fell down the chimney, hitting her on the ow head. She counted them. There were 19 keys in total. It seemed like the poltergeist, dubbed Fred, had collected every single key in the home. I mean, at least he was kind enough to give them back, though. That's He's true. like, oh, I'm going to steal all your keys, and here you go. Nah, give them back. I'm, I'm only messing. Yeah. After sorting through them, however, there was one old-ass key they never identified. And Jean mm. still has it. Well, I think Jean is dead now. Yeah. But she still had it. If we were recording this maybe 20 years ago or whenever, before she died. She had it then. The poltergeist even began to make an appearance. And this is like frightening. This is yeah. genuinely like terrifying. Yeah. One night while Jean and Joe were in bed, the door slowly opened and they saw a shadowy figure standing in the doorway. Jean described it as a very tall, and hooded figure, like a monk. And that's how it's got that's how it got its name. You know, right? The black monk of Pontefract. But as soon as they turned on the bedside light, the figure vanished. Yeah, I kinda like picture like a ring wraith, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, for sure. The situation finally reached its breaking point about two years after the Pritchard family first started experiencing torments. One night, when Diane went out to make coffee in the kitchen, the lights suddenly went out, and while Jean Pritchard was searching for a flashlight, she heard Diane scream. Even though it was getting dark, there was still just enough light to see around, and they found Diane being dragged up the stairs. Her cardigan was stretched out in front of her as if Fred was pulling on it, dragging her up via the cardigan, and another hand was around her throat. Philip and Jean rushed up the stairs to help, trying to pull Diane back down. She was terrified. This was the first time the poltergeist had physically, like, assaulted her. In the struggle, Philip and Jean ended up tumbling down the stairs with Diane. Philip thought that his attempt to touch the presence might have made it, like, let go of his sister. Diane was given a large-ass brandy to calm her nerves, and in the light, they saw red finger marks around her throat. There were a few more occurrences of poltergeist activity, but thankfully none resulted in physical harm to the family. And then, just like that, as suddenly as it started, the disturbances stopped. Philip reported seeing a dark figure vanish into the floor one day, sinking maybe back down into the well. Okay, see you. See you guys later, bye. I've had a good time. (laughs) I always remember this. (laughs) 
And from that moment on, peace and quiet returned to Turdy East Drive. Mm. Or did it, oh, he? Because we will get into it. So earlier on, uh, we mentioned that the haunting at Turdy East Drive is not only famous for its intense activity, but also for how well it was documented. Back in the 1960s, local newspapers, they briefly covered the story. I was researching on newspapers.com and there was an article about it. But without any official investigation, the story just kind of, you know, was almost lost to history. Then, about 10 years later, after this, and in the 70s, a young amateur historian with a special interest in the Cluniac monks of Pontefract, he heard about the case and decided to dive into it. What he found in the old newspapers was almost unbelievable. A poltergeist linked to the Cluniac monk who'd been hanged for rape back in Henry VIII's time. Mm -hmm. It's that guy. Yeah, it's Fuckers him. back again. Oh my god. Oh my, oh, oh my word. <laughs> Can't get rid of him. No, no. He's the worst one as well. Why can not we get one of the nice ones? He visited uh, the Pritchard family who were still living in this, well, it was haunted, not haunted anymore, maybe. And uh, he listened to their stories about, you know, their experiences. And you know, this historian was like, oh, man, that's him. Mm. That's got to be him. It's, yeah, that, yeah. It's, that, it's that old murdering, raping ghost that you're hearing about. It's got to be. Uh, the historian, he also spoke with friends and neighbors and even some local officials who had witnessed the, the strange events. And then he reached out to his, uh, to his colleague. Colin Wilson, who was a well-known uh, paranormal author, to suggest, hey, listen, there might, uh, might be some meat on this bone, you know mm. what I'm saying? Wilson agreed that it was worth exploring further. And so in 1980, he went to Pontefract to investigate Turdy East Drive. He interviewed the, the Pritchards and he gathered their first-hand uh, accounts, which led to his book, Poltergeist. Uh, I'm saying it like that because it does have an exclamation mark on it. Got it, got it. A study in destructive haunting. Which is a good book. Is it? Yeah, well... It seems uh, interesting. It's all about... It's not just about the story, I believe. It's about, like, general polar guys. It is, It yeah. focuses a lot on the Pritchard family haunting, yeah. but it's also, like, about other shit. Yeah, there's a good section. I got the book for... Uh, I use a lot of book for researching for, yeah. for this, that, and another book. But, okay. yeah, it, it, it's a very, very good book. Cool. You brought up earlier that there was a 2012 movie about this haunting called When the Lights Went Out. Yeah, I should have called it When the when the the movie projector went off, went out, because that's what I was waiting for. <laughs> Fucking getting roasted yeah, over there. Yeah, gotcha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I haven't actually seen it. Maybe I'm sure. It's, yeah. it's, I'm sure it's, it's fine. It's good. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's fine. It's 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 not great. <laughs> it was all right. It wasn't great, but it was fine. So uh, what's interesting about this movie though is the director Pat Holden. He had a personal connection to the story. Really? So Jean Pritchard, who was at the center of the hunting, was Pat's aunt's sister. Oh. So Pat's mom, Irene Holden, used to visit Jean a lot during the hauntings and she was like there to be super supportive. So Pat, he was too young to visit the house back then, but he'd heard all the stories from, from his mom and he really got into the whole mystery. That fascination, it eventually led to him making When the Lights Go Out. So if, uh, I know like you have seen it, but if the listener, if you've seen it and you're familiar with the house, wh what it looks like from countless documentaries online, you might be thinking that the film was actually shot in the house because it looks so much like it and he knew the house owner. Yeah. But uh, it's it's not. So the film was actually shot um, in Huddersfield. So they chose to build the set because it was easier to manage the filming crew and to get the right camera angles. Yeah. And at the time, they thought Gene was still living in the house. So Pat Holden and the producer, Bill Bungay, decided to stay away and avoid putting extra stress on her. But when the filming had finished, the producer, he happened to be in Pontefract on other business. And he decided to pop by the house just to, just to check it out. I mean, they did a whole film about it. He's like, I'll see what all the fuss is about. Yeah. So he wasn't expecting what he found. Now, it wasn't a ghost. It was a for sale sign. It turned out that 30 East Drive had been on the market for nearly four years after Gene had moved to a retirement home. So they actually could have shot oh it there. It's it a gold mine. Ghost mine. <laughs> ghost mine. But uh, Bill, so he couldn't resist the opportunity and he bought the house, which was at a bargain uh, due to its reputation. Yeah. So he planned to use it for promoting the film. And they ended up hosting the film's premiere in the living room of 30 East Drive for a couple who were lucky or unlucky competition winners. So no paranormal activity happened that night, but it was great for publicity. I say, going to see that film in the haunted house is brilliant. <laughs> There's something about it, but when you see the house and you're just like, you know, you see pictures of inside the house. It's like, that's, it's kind of such a, it's like the saddest movie premiere though ever. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm like, it's, it's literally just a regular living room. It is, yeah, yeah. And you're just like, oh, here's, here, here's your popcorn. Here's <laughs> your winning prize. And it's yeah. like just a, yeah. it's just, I don't know. Well, that's why there was only two winners. Like the house wasn't huge. Yeah, I know. It's, it's quite a small house, yeah. 
So Bill, he kept the house after that, though he's never spent a night in there himself. Mm-hmm. He, he's, he said he's had plenty of guests who reported strange poltergeist events. These days, you can actually book a stay in the house yourself. And there have been several paranormal investigation teams who've caught some intriguing orbs on camera. Oh, so, hells check. yeah. There's <laughs> nothing I love more than a good ass orb. Good orb. Like I said, this is why we got to go to your haunted house and do a Zach Baggins uh, thing. So I think, ooh, That's I feel a dark person. <laughs> this, is, this is the most evil feeling I've ever felt in my life. And it's like, that an orb? <laughs> You're like, all right, yeah, it's terrifying right, cool. shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's actually interesting. So I had a goo at the website. Um, it's just like 30eastdrive.com. Mm-hmm. And and it's fascinating. It's actually, it's an interesting website. So, you know, the family, as we said, the family said all the haunting just stopped one night. The ghost just kind mm. of like, we'll see you, boy. Yep. It's like melted into the floor. Mm. Like uh, like Terminator 2 style. Yeah, yeah, Giving yeah. the thumbs up as it goes down. That was so much better, actually, if it had done that. <laughs> that got me. <laughs> yeah. But no, apparently the, the ghosts haven't stopped. It's still out there. So you can read, so I, I can't read, there's like, it's not like 200, uh, 288 uh, quotes from people who have been inside the house. Yeah, they have uh, a whole book, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read out some here. Okay, so this is the quote. Tall shadow of a man walked from the kitchen into the wall. Ooh. And this uh, witness was competition winner. Okay. Okay. Right? Well, if the competition winner says they saw something, <laughs> it must be true. Maybe there were people who won the tickets to the premiere. Could have been. Red carpet was rolled out. That's where he's driving. Uh, here's another one. Glowing ball of blue light in corridor. Seen from window several times. On one occasion, police were called. Oh. The witness was a uh, neighbor and friends. Vase thrown violently at guests as they arrived. That's from a Hazel F. Uh, circled. They just went to the wrong house, though. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they went 29 East Drive. Yeah. <laughs> classic mistake. Circle drawn on back by a finger in the middle of the night. Ooh. Uh, that's by Deborah. Uh, a black mass appeared from the floor when a guest started speaking in Latin. Um, the clock on the kitchen fireplace had been turned around to face the wall and was now tick ticking. <gasps> Ooh. It's not just going, it's tick ticking. That's uh, Amanda M. Yeah, in fact, so as I said, there's 288 recent uh, quote unquote uh, happenings along with some pictures and videos. Mm-hmm, as Keith mm-hmm. said, you can go into, a, they have a YouTube uh, and a, like they have pictures. So mm. if you go into the quotes, they'll have some highlights and stuff like that. So for example, uh, yeah, I mean, I can describe some, but like infrared photo taken in darkness of the bathroom. So mm. it's from Dan's room of the, of the bathroom. And a distinct uh, human form was captured on photo. And then it has in brackets, uh, incredible. Okay. Uh, that's the link you <laughs> click on is you click on the incredible. <laughs> and when you click on it, it's uh, very much not incredible. Uh, this is the figure key. Is it? Oh, that is grainy as shit. Yeah, it looks literally like it could be a, a dildo. I literally <laughs> have no idea what it is. Uh, anyway, so obviously great to talk about videos and pictures in an audio-only format. But as Keith so eloquently put it, you yourself can stay in the home. Let me mm. read this out. Okay, because I, 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 I don't read it too much, but this is I love this ad. So, 30 East Drive, Pontefract. So this is me reading it word for word. Whatever. Yeah, okay. And I will share it because some of the parts are capitalized. So, Turney East Drive, Pontefract, is not a traditional guest house, hotel, B&B, or party venue, and the owner recommends that you do not visit, especially if you are of nervous disposition or have a heart condition. The owner himself has never spent the night there and has no intention of doing so at any time soon, having personally witnessed it, mm. quote unquote. There are beds, but no bedding. So bring bring your own sheets and duvet, <laughs> folks. Uh, a kettle, but no breakfast. So you can make a cup of coffee, uh, but no no sausages. Uh, it smells a little damp, not because of any leaks, mind you, but mainly because of the old well oh. down which the body of the executed monk and his victims were said to have been thrown. Ooh. Said to by whom? Uh, by me. <laughs> Just inventing this. Just that that part of the story, I just, I don't buy with like, yeah. executing Tron Mountain into their only water source yes. in the town. <laughs> yeah, it makes zero sense yeah. whatsoever. But uh, hey, listen, it seems good. This is occasionally mitigated by the dry heat from the, in brackets, professionally maintained central heating system when it mm. chooses to leave it alone. It's messing with the radiators, yeah. folks. God damn it. The furniture is 70s authentic. It was bought from charity shops locally as the original furniture was removed by the Pritchard family, as represented in the movie When the Lights Went Out, before they sold the property. I'll, it's got to put the promotion for the movie in there. As is the overall experience, as it, well, it's a 70s 
experience. 70s, mm-hmm. It's an authentic 70s experience. Yeah. The uh, temperamental cooker is original and dishwashers didn't exist in the 70s. If you get the drift. <laughs> then, this is me reading it out, but it says, <laughs> if you get the drift, question mark at the end. Oh, and on one fairly recent occasion, the bed in the small room, Diane's, was trashed by the poltergeist, Fred, during a 3 a.m. loss of temper. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not fixing it. Yeah, exactly. I thought Fred had gone, by the way, and now he's back again, and he loses his temper at 3 a.m. Just let that tome comes back up. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I'm back again. Yeah. Uh, so please bear this in mind when deciding to spend the night in this particular room. If, however, you get a trill from the idea of spending time in the in a 50s built ex council house in the unpredictable presence of one of the most terrifying poltergeists in history, then be our guests. And you'll need to uh, pay something towards the maintenance of the property and respectfully abide by some rules. Now, I actually was reading through this. So obviously you pay. That's fine. Mm, yeah. And uh, some rules. That's fine, too. And I was expecting the rules to be weird, but they're mm. not really. It just says basically no alcohol, mm-hmm. make minimum noise, no Ouija boards, Keith. Mm. And let the record show. I'm pointing at Keith when I, when I say no Ouija boards. Uh, no exorcisms. Also pointing at Keith. Okay. What? Uh, no, ref- <laughs> <laughs> no refunds and no souvenirs. You're not allowed to take anything. From Dragging them. a couch. Okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 70s authentic. They don't make it like this anymore. And the cost is, for any of you folks who are listening, maybe uh, some of you are adventurous, like to go uh-huh. ghost adventures, or maybe some of you even live near Pontefract, let us know. So if you want to stay there on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or bank holiday, it's £400. Jesus, okay. For the night. Or, but and if you want no to stay breakfast. there... No breakfast. <laughs> yeah. All you get is a kettle. <laughs> okay. And if you stay there on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night, it's £300. Jesus, okay. A hundred weird difference. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. For next time. Although then again, it says uh, you need to pay something towards the maintenance of the property. And £400 it seems quite expensive for the maintenance of the property. Yeah, yeah, it so does. So it's kind of feeling a bit ripped off. Mm-hmm. 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 We're just paying his mortgage. <laughs> yeah, yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although he said the house was cheap. He's probably making a, a shitload of money out of this. And also it says at the bottom, by the way, I love this. Also, protection spells available. Ah, that's uh, nice. If you are concerned about your visit, you can have a protection spell performed for you by a local medium. The cost is £10 per person and is very comforting indeed, <laughs> okay. uh, it says. That's pretty good. I mean, you know, yeah. £10 is pretty good. Don't know where you get it. Like, I wouldn't show up to a haunted house That's... and be like, I just want a nice, quiet night. Literally. <laughs> okay. After it says that you can get a protection spell if you want for a mere of your 10, 10 <laughs> fun books, you know, you spend your fun books here, folks. And then it has a quote from uh, Mrs. B. It says, Perhaps it was the protection spell we received, but we felt safer than we expected during our visit and ended up having a very good night's sleep. <laughs> it's like, what? Why would you want to? Why would you want a good night's sleep in supposedly one of those haunted houses in America? It's like, or in uh, in England. It's like, great, I'm in a haunted house. Oh, early night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for four hundred quid. See like, you more. I want the full experience. Yeah, I want to be up all night. I want to yeah. be shitting myself. I want to be levitating around the bed. Yeah, I yeah. want to, this guy thumbs up me. <laughs> Black monk. That's awesome. You want to what? Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and thanks so much for listening to the That Chapter podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little episode of our Paranormal Spectacularum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this was a lot of fun, Keith. I really enjoyed it. The paranormal ones are always a humdinger. Yep, yep. Always fun. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, let's good do one. more. We shall. We shall indeed. We, we were actually just talking before we started recording about some other uh, spooky stories we got. So please give them a goo. As always, uh, please rate and review the podcast if you can, wherever you can. It really helps uh, me and Keith out here. But so many of you have also already done it. So thanks so much. But you know what? Keep doing it. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. why not? Uh, yeah. All right. Here, listen. Next episode will be up. Well, it's out every Monday. So yep, it'll yep. be up on Monday. I like it. <laughs> Keith looked like he was thinking about it. He's like, uh, Monday, when Tuesday. It's the same day every week, <laughs> folks. Uh, so we post every Monday morning. Uh, that's when the That Sharp podcast is out. Uh, new videos if you're in for more. Uh, you know, without Keith, so the, the yep. better, the top tier content, <laughs> really. Sans Keith. <laughs> uh, is on every Tuesday. But you know, it's stick around for the boat. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Why not? You're rude uh, yeah. not to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, right. Listen, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. I'll see you. There you go. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Come on. You know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Wait <for it. laughs> Okay. I should have had this ready, but they exist. What do demons exist to do, Keith? They exist purely to cause chaos. Yes, they do. <laughs> In August of 1960. <laughs>